Okay. Thanks for joining in, guys. Today, we've got part two of my discussion with uh, ESG analyst, investor, and importantly, Bitcoiner, Daniel Batten. The first time around, uh, he told us all about how Bitcoin mining is accelerating renewable energy adoption. And we focus mainly on um, carbon emissions. This time, we're going to talk about displacing methane gas from the environment. Daniel, welcome and thanks for uh, joining me again. Yeah, thanks for having me back. It's ab- Good to be here. It's absolutely my pleasure to do that. Hey, today we're going to talk about something a little bit different, but uh, certainly on the same uh, theme, methane gas. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what it is and why we're so concerned about it? Yeah, it's really interesting. When people think about climate change, typically you think about carbon dioxide. And with good reason, because that is the major greenhouse gas that is causing climate change right now. However, the number two gas is methane. It's responsible for around 25 to 30% of all climate change. The thing about methane, though, is that its rate at which it's been released into the atmosphere is accelerating, and it's accelerating rapidly. And the other thing about methane is that it is over a 100-year period it is 30 times more powerful as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And so what that means is that if suddenly your methane emissions ramp up massively, then that's going to accelerate climate change. And what we're noticing is that a lot of the climate models that have been developed recently have underestimated the speed of climate change. They've underestimated the amount of extreme weather events, and they've underestimated the speed at which sea levels are rising. And the analysis on why that is the case has been that methane emissions have been higher than we've expected to such an extent that to give you an idea of how important this is, the United Nations Environment Program, which works closely with the International Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, came out very recently, earlier this year, and said that reducing methane is our strongest lever to reduce climate change over the next 25 years. Wow. So what what are the sources of methane then? Where's it all coming from? Well, there's methane that occurs and gets released naturally in nature. That might be things such as swamps, for example. Any time you get decay, which is not in the presence of air. So if you have a compost heap and you're not turning it, chances are that's emitting methane. If you have a landfill, that's going to be subject to anaerobic respiration. In other words, it's rotting without air. That's releasing huge quantities of methane. Mm, Any time that you you have a farm, you have animals, they're releasing methane. And in two sources, from the belches of cows, sheep, and also and any agricultural animals, but also for for the poop as well. So it's coming from both ends, you can say. Now, the other way that it's coming is from in the oil and gas industry, when an oil and gas company or a coal company hits uh, their deposits, they often not just hit oil, but they will inevitably hit gas as well. And when that gas is too far away from a pipeline, it's not economical to be able to ship it to that pipeline to transport it. It simply gets flared into the atmosphere, um, but that is incompletely burnt. So there is always quite a substantial portion of methane that still goes directly into the air. So it's, it's well, in two parts. First of all, it's an organic process as a result of decay, but also part of the oil and gas industry exploration. It's, it's, is, is it accurate to say it's a byproduct? of oil and gas exploration, do they actively see Yes. Okay. And, and what happens to that byproduct at the moment? So at the moment, there's a few things that can happen with it. Uh, sometimes if they're really lucky and they're close to a gas pipeline, it can be utilized. But typically, if you think about an oil field, they're not going to be anywhere near a gas pipeline. Uh, the research tells us that typically they're at least five kilometers away. And it's simply not economical to transport it because a gas pipeline costs around about 
five million dollars per mile to build out, and it also takes a lot of time, and it takes a lot of deployment of different resources to make that happen when they're focused on oil extraction. So typically, what happens is it just gets flared, which means they have a little tube that goes into the air. It's called a flare stack, and you've probably seen images of oil feeds fields with burning gas, and that's what it's doing. It's burning the methane that has simply been wasted. So it's an environmental pollutant and it's an economic waste at the same time. And that's kind of okay, but the problem is it only burns 92% of it. You might think, oh, 92%, that's pretty good. But the problem is, remember, of course, that methane over a 100-year period is 30 times more heating than carbon dioxide. Any release of methane at all is going to have a quite pronounced effect on the climate. Hmm. So um, just to give a definition to our terminology, flaring is actually just burning the gas off. So anytime you see a photo with uh, a flame of it, you know, in an oil gas pipeline, that's actually gas being flared. And, you know, much of that is methane. Are there any other gases that that's part of that mix as well? There's a few others. They're all hydrocarbons for the most part there's there's methane ethane propane butane so there's some other slightly heavier hydrocarbons most of it is methane between 80 and 90 percent typically and then there may be some residuals such as a bit of carbon dioxide a bit of water vapor but most of it's methane do we have any kind of uh, data on what what's the volume of um or the quantity of methane gas that's actually flared and what percentage of the overall mix that makes up. So, for example, you know, we've spoken about different sources of, of methane. Um, yeah. What percentage of that comes from oil and gas exploration? So, in oil and gas, you've got around about, I did some calculations on this, and CoinShares did some as well. And it looks like it's getting up towards 700, 800 million uh, tons that's in what you call CO2 equivalent. So what you do is you you look at the methane and then you say, okay, we've got this much methane. So the actual volume of methane is 30 times less than that. But then what you do is you turn it into what's called a carbon dioxide equivalent. And so you look and you say, okay, well, that's 30 times worse than carbon dioxide. So that's the equivalent of 800 million tons of carbon dioxide. And that represents, you can say, put it this way, if you total up the emissions from oil fields and the emissions of landfills together, those two, if you were to completely remove that, you'd remove more than 40% of all human-caused methane if you would eliminate those two sources. So how do okay? So how do we go about putting this to good use? We we know the benefits of um, so not the benefits, but the ability of Bitcoin mining to be co-located with energy sources. How do we combine the two? Well, the the great thing about Bitcoin mining is that it is, as you know, it's location agnostic and it's time of day agnostic. So what does that mean in simple language? What it means is you can plonk it anywhere. You can put it in an oil field. You can have these mobile mining units and you can... Now, obviously, you've got to do something else in between. You can't just put miners there and uh, use the gas directly. So in between, what you do is you have a generator. And it works on the same principle as a gas turbine or a diesel generator. So what it's doing is it's taking that gas and rather than getting flared into the atmosphere, it gets pushed into a pipe and that's used typically to turn a, a gas turbine. And that turbine starts spinning and that will generate electricity. And then the next thing is there'll be a Bitcoin mobile mining unit there, which is utilizing that electricity. So in the process, so two things are happening. Number one is they're monetizing that. So they're turning something which is a liability, an environmental liability, into an asset. And, and that's really important because one of the best ways to make sure that you tidy up the environment is if you can do it in such a way where you're not having to spend money to do it, but you're actually making a profit doing it, you're just much more likely to get a whole lot of business synergies such that people will work together to make it happen without needing any government incentive at all or needing carbon credits or anything like that. So that's what started to happen with Cruzo Energy, with Giga, and with a number of different companies who are now moving generators and Bitcoin mobile miners 
into these oil fields and starting to use this methane gas. Now, here's the key thing. When it's going into a generator, rather than losing 8% of the methane into the air, they're now only losing 0.1% of the methane. So it's 1 80th as much of the methane is going into the air. So it's and, of course, when you combust methane, you're still getting carbon dioxide. So it's not a perfect solution. The perfect solution was just you'd somehow gather all that methane up and you'd store it somewhere. You'd do something with it. Um, the problem is how are you going to gather it and where are you going to store it? It's, it's not economically viable and it's not logistically viable for the most part. So the next best thing you can do is you turn it into carbon dioxide. Now, that doesn't sound intuitively great, does it? It's like we think, well, hang on, carbon dioxide? Isn't that what we're supposed to be getting rid of? Yes, it is. However, remember that you're turning a greenhouse gas, which is 30 times more powerful than carbon dioxide, into carbon dioxide. So the net benefit is it's more than 10 times as good as just releasing that methane directly into the air. Yeah, so... You, you mentioned earlier that um, there's a benefit, there's a financial benefit to doing this. Now, we, we know that um, a lot of jurisdictions impose a cost to carbon. Is there something similar to methane? How is that treated in the sort of carbon offset, carbon credit scheme? Is there a similar or an equivalent to that for methane? Anything which is a carbon equivalent, so if you're reducing nitrous oxide emissions, if you're reducing methane emissions, anything which is going to have a heating effect on the atmosphere, uh, that potentially comes into some emission trading scheme or something you can get credits for. Generally, what happens is if it's government regulated that you cannot do it, it's government mandated, you can't claim carbon credits because that's something you should be doing anyway. But if it's not regulated, if it's not mandated, and someone comes in and they do something which is emission reduction, then that potentially can earn carbon credits depending on which jurisdiction you're in in the world. Mm, okay. So how, how is this, um, how, how is Bitcoin mining being deployed? You mentioned Cruzo Energy. Um, are these merely experiments and pilots or are we looking at, you know, uh, the potential for this to be deployed at much greater scale? The pilot's completed, was very successful, and is now in the process of being rolled out to four more sites internationally. Caruso Energy has been funded to the tune of $505 million. And the, what's really interesting is if you look at the companies that are putting into this, two of them are climate tech funds, which is kind of devastating news for the people who claim that Bitcoin mining is bad for the environment because if you have a climate tech fund, its entire mandate, its reason to be the wholesale investors they have attracted, its ESG mandate is all around. You can only invest in things which are going to have a net positive effect on the environment. And not one but two different climate tech funds have said, yes, we're getting behind this type of Bitcoin mining because it has such a positive benefit for the environment. What it does basically is it doesn't solve climate change, but it buys us more time because it's removing this incredibly potent greenhouse gas from the atmosphere. So you have two climate tech funds that have got behind it, um, G2 and Generate, and you've also got the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Oman who invested in it because they could see that it would help to meet some of their carbon reduction emissions at the same time as providing, frankly, a profitable business. Hmm. Hmm. So I, I, when I look at this argument, I see two sides. One saying, don't worry about don't worry about greenhouse gases. Carbon's great. We're all made of carbon. And then the other side is, well, this isn't great because all it is is, you know, um, it uh, improves the viability of fossil fuel projects. And somehow you've got to navigate <laughs> the middle path. How does an ESG investor do that? What are the arguments that you make that uh, address both sides? Yeah, when you're looking at this argument that we shouldn't be doing things which help oil companies, I think we've got to look at things in a more nuanced way than that because the reality is we, we're in the middle of this massive transition and, and transition is the key word. We're transitioning our grid 
from a, a grids around the world which are predominantly based on fossil fuels to predominantly based on renewables or exclusively based on renewables. And in the same way, we need to do everything possible to transition oil companies away from things which are having a devastating climate impact into things which do not have a climate impact. BP, for example, right now in Australia is behind the one of the largest solar farms ever, building over a gigawatt of capacity in the Northern Territory, and will be using that to fuel their hydrogen plants to create hydrogen. Now, it's not perfect. It's a long way from it, uh, because that hydrogen is still coming from natural gas. However, this is part of the transition story. And when you look at something such as Bitcoin mining and oil companies partnering with Bitcoin miners, every time that an oil company does something which is net carbon reducing rather than net carbon increasing, it's helping them to derive income from a source which is net positive rather than net negative to the planet. Now, you can look at it and say, well, they shouldn't be drilling for oil in the first place. It's only as a function of that that the gas is released. And yes, that's true. However, I think that everyone would agree that we'd have some fairly major problems if suddenly all oil drilling stopped tomorrow. So it's not going to be something that's going to stop immediately. It is going to continue for a little while. We want to stop it as soon as possible and find alternatives to that as soon as possible. And in the meantime, if we can mitigate some of the worst consequences of oil extraction, um, then that's a tremendous positive. So I, I don't want to broaden the discussion uh, into a general topic, uh, into the general topic of uh, energy consumption. But let's get back to this uh, Bitcoin mining, uh, particularly uh, utilizing flared gas and methane. Which which parts of the world seem to be most uh, enthusiastic about it? You mentioned uh, the Oman sovereign wealth fund is the cruzo yeah. energy um pilot that they conducted where was that conducted uh that was in dakota the initial one and then they're looking for four other territories which will include sites outside the united states any areas in particular that you can talk about uh they're keeping it a little bit under wraps at the moment so it's we'll we'll find out in the near future but if you look at some of the areas of the world which have particularly high methane emissions there's some places in Africa which are very high, there's places in the Middle East which are very high, there's some parts in America which are very high, and so they tend to be in countries where there's a lot of oil and gas extraction going on, and sometimes mm -hmm. in countries where it's not as well regulated, because the other thing is that it's not always even burnt, sometimes it is vented, that just means it goes straight into the atmosphere, it's like a the difference between a a lighter which you've lit and a lighter which you haven't, and the gas just goes directly into the sky. That's even worse because that means 100% of the methane is going into the atmosphere. And, and, and sorry it, to interrupt you, but in those yeah. circumstances, is the methane accounted for? Is it is it counted as part of the uh, oil and gas industry emissions, or is it just are they in such circumstances and the quality of operations just don't literally don't even count that um, of those emissions? Well, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, there, the, the EPA in the United States has tried the, the best it can to work out what the level of emissions are just in the United States. There are organizations that have attempted to measure methane internationally. It's been done traditionally on estimates. The only way you can do it accurately is through satellite imaging. And recently this was done by NASA, in fact, who spent six years doing methane emission analysis over landfills. And then there was another organization, the Environmental Defense Fund, who had their own satellite uh, that they sponsored to do some um, emission measuring over the Permian Basin, which is between New Mexico and Texas. And each of these satellites, when they measured these areas, uh, one was done under landfills in California, the other one was in the Permian Basin, the one over the landfills, they found that the emissions were three and a half times worse than the EPA data, three and a half times worse. And the Environmental Defense Fund, when they did it over Texas, they found that it was um, actually other way around, sorry, two and a half times worse over the landfills and three and a half times worse over the oil flares. So we've got the data out there, but when we actually go and we measure them with the satellites, we 
find that actually it's worse than we imagined. And that starts to explain why there might be some discrepancies between how fast our models say climate change should be occurring and how fast it's actually occurring. Wow. So, okay. That's, uh, that's extraordinary. So just to give uh, people a definition, landfills are where all your household refuse and garbage all your waste goes. basically yeah. goes. Yeah. It used to be called the dump. Now they've got some slightly more sophisticated technologies, not just a pit in the earth. Um, it's, they're, they are, there's quite a bit of technology to them. And, but it's basically what many people would call the dump. Okay, so, you know, I don't know too much about landfills, and when I hear the term, I just uh, sort of conjure up an image of an not, open Not a time you world. kind of spend a lot of time thinking about or want to take your family <laughs> for a visit. We tend to kind of keep them away from sight and don't spend a lot of time there. So, so I imagine kind of this open pit where, you know, trucks roll in, empty their contents and, and go away. How does... How do you capture the methane from a situation like that? How does that actually happen? Yeah, well, to do it, there's a couple of things. So the first thing is um, you put a system of pipes into it. Um, and this technology is well established. It's been done for actually quite a while. You put pipes in. And the second thing is you create a vacuum. So it sucks all the methane into a common area and then goes through some pipes. And then typically what will happen is the same thing that happens in the oil and gas industry, which is once you have all the methane, then you'll burn it. It gets flared. And same problem, that again, not all of it is actually getting flared. The complication you've got with landfills, though, is that venting is much more common than it is in oil and gas. In other words, whereas in, in America, most of the oil and gas is flared. With landfills, most of it is vented. Most of it just escapes straight into the atmosphere because it's not currently regulated. It's only just, there's been a mandate put out by the current administration in the US to start regulating it, but it hasn't been for a long time. And so a lot of people have just let it go straight into the air. And so who's responsible for that? Uh, are landfills are they privatized, for example, in America? Are they privatized or public? I don't know that. You have, you have different um, organizations, different waste management companies. So you'll have a number of different landfills that will all come under the jurisdiction of one waste management company. So it's, it's private. And different parts of the world, some will be privately owned, some will be owned by the local government authority. So you can have different systems. And, and so who'd be responsible for that gas then? Are they simply... Um, is the owner of the landfill or the operator of the landfill responsible for those emissions? Yeah, the companies who own, who own those landfills. And, and as I say, they've had, there's been no regulation that said they've had to do anything about it until very recently. The regulation is only just coming in to say that, actually, you've got to start reducing this methane because it is so potent. Now, we, we know anecdotally that that whilst the government might say you need to do something about it, um, from some of the conversations I've had from people in the industry, there are also some land oper landfill operators who said, well, we're not going to do it. We're just going to continue emitting anyway. Oh. And how did I, I get away with that? That sounds uh, quite strange. So the, the absence well, of regulation and is basically it just – Allowed, gives them a free reign to do whatever they want at the moment. But so what? Okay, I don't want to get too much into the politics of it at this point. I'm really focus. I want to focus on the yeah. commercial aspect at this at this point. Yeah. So, um, particularly, so okay, we've got Cruzo doing running a couple of pilots, and they're looking for a number of international uh, locations for that. There seems to be a yeah. lot of secrecy and, around. And not um, only not only Crusoe either. There's there's a number that have come in. There's a new one in Europe that's come in. There's there's Giga that's been going for a while. So there's actually quite a few who are starting to do it. We've seen the numbers rise, and we've got around ten companies now who are using some sort of burning of methane, whether that comes from animal waste, from landfills, or from flared gas. Now, so it's rising pretty rapidly. So uh, are we talking about oil companies looking to partner with Bitcoin miners or are they looking yes, to get into the Bitcoin part. mining themselves eventually? Uh, it might move in that direction at some point in the future. It's always hard to know exactly how industries converge. At the moment, though, it's through partnerships with Bitcoin mining companies. 
Mm. And what why do you, what necessitate necess, necessitates the need for secrecy at the moment? I think it's just they wanting to, um, like any company, get the data back before they um, go too public about it, and they want to be absolutely sure that this is going to the actual results are going to be as good as what they suspect based on the pilot. I don't think it's so, anything more than that. Oh, okay. So it's it's just managing expectations for shareholders, stakeholders, and the like. It's yep. it, there's no sort of commercial secrecy and competitive advantage. They want to guard and get a jump on their competitors and that sort of thing. There, there could be. We we could speculate. The reason I asked that is uh, some time ago there was there was a report of Saudi Aramco doing something similar with Bitcoin mining, and uh, you know normally something like that would just be allowed to sort of fizzle away in the background, but they came out with an official statement denying this. And I just thought, why, why would they even bother to do that? Um, what is the significance of the rumour to them in any case? So, yeah, that, that just remained an open question for me. I thought I'd uh, ask you. So, um, okay. So we, we know what methane is. We know where it's coming from. We can see that um, some Bitcoin miners and oil and gas producers are partnering up in pilot projects. Where do you think is the first instance of this being deployed in scale? Where do you think that will happen? I believe the next great move at scale is going to be into the landfill area for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one is that the amount of methane emissions from landfills is even bigger than is occurring in the oil and gas industry, as far as we know from our measurements anyway. And, and the second area is that to date that hasn't been as richly explored as a possibility. Uh, and the third reason, in fact, is that there, as I was saying before, there's a lot of venting that's going on. So the net environmental benefit through taking these emissions from landfills and cleanly combusting them is going to be even more significant Hmm. I, I I look at this and it's just a no-brainer to me, especially as the uh, you know the fact that we've got Bitcoin miners that are location agnostic, as we, as we discussed in previous sessions. Yeah, there's um, a couple of things that people sometimes say, which are uh, the the common things I get is people might say something such as, "Well, why can't we use that to generate electricity for EVs or for hospitals or for residential heating?" Hmm. And sometimes you can. If the landfill is close enough to residential housing, then you can. If the landfill happens to be really close to a gas pipeline, then absolutely you can deploy it and you can use it for, for that purpose instead. In fact, I would say you should use it for that purpose because if you can capture that gas, that is better than burning it and still creating a slight residue of carbon dioxide afterwards. Where Bitcoin mining comes in is the fact that that's not every landfill. A lot of these landfills are not near residential housing areas for obvious reasons. A lot of these landfills are not near the grid. They're not near gas pipelines. In those situations where it's simply not going to be economical, plus it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of regulation, for example, to build out pylons if you're going to generate the electricity on site or gas pipelines if you're not, and large expense. And who's going to pay for that? The government? I don't think so. Maybe they'll print some money. Who knows? But a better solution is going to be you've got Bitcoin miners who can deploy there. And not only is that not a cost, that's actually going to create revenue for the landfill owners themselves. And now they've turned a liability, an environmental liability, a climate liability, into a monetizable asset where they're now getting paid for electricity generation. So mm. it's, a, it's an incredible win-win. And it allows things to happen on a scale, which is other... People have known about this issue in landfills for a long time and there's been a lot of talk over the course of 10 years, 20 years. Virtually nothing has happened. Only a very few amount of landfills in the world have had that gas captured and used for anything productive. And the reason very little has happened is these issues I mentioned, such as it's not particularly economical, it's not particularly logistically feasible. And now suddenly we've got Bitcoin mining, which is solving both of those issues. And this can be deployed at a massive scale, and it can help to really... Uh, Troy Cross uses the expression that Bitcoin mining is like the environmental dung beetle, which I think is a great analogy. It just kind of sponges everything up and takes care of it at a, at a big scale. Um, and that's really what it has the capacity to do. So it's, it's a very exciting technology. 
So what's detracting from this understanding? I mean, it seems that no matter what we do in our own space, um, this point of view just doesn't seem to be able to gain any traction beyond our bubble. Why do you think that is? Yeah, it's it's an interesting one. Um, when you look at any new disruptive technology, whether it's the internet, whether it's, if you look back in the day, even to radio or books, then by virtue of the fact it's disruptive, there will be people who stand to be disrupted. And they're not just going to lie down and usher in the new technology. The print media didn't say, fantastic, we've got the internet now, we'll all take early retirement and stop printing newspapers. They did everything in their power to try to suggest to people that the internet was a really bad idea. And one of the, the levers they used to try and persuade people of this was it was terrible because it would consume massive amounts of energy and that was bad for the environment. So there, there's a narrative that is latched onto another new technology called Bitcoin, and it's a very similar one. So we've heard this many times. And so in the face of this headwind, whether it's true or not, doesn't really matter. It's more a case of, is it going to help to stop the advancement of a disruptive technology that threatens um, an existing legacy system, in this case, the fiat money system, so the central banking system, perceived or real threat. And so in the face of that, then, well, you, you have certain narratives that have taken hold. Of course, a lot of those messages have been about it's bad for the environment. Um, then when people start doing some deep analysis in that and saying, hey, well, that's, a, that's actually not accurate. The net benefit is positive. Then because you already have that entrenched viewpoint, then there's a risk that when you hear someone say, no, no, it's actually it's good for the environment. Well, then an environmentalist can say, well, well, you're just saying that because you've got a vested interest in the success of Bitcoin. And so it sounds like something called greenwash. In other words, the, the sort of thing such as putting a few solar panels on the on the top of your gas station um, whilst you're still extracting massive amounts of climate change causing petrol and, um, and oil from the ground, a few solar panels isn't going to cut it. So it sounds a little bit like that, but in fact it's not. What is actually happening is this is an attempt to to have a complete analysis and something that was never complete because the argument against Bitcoin, which has said, hey, it's bad for the environment because it uses energy, and some of that energy is fossil fuel, you can turn that argument to any technology you want. You can turn that argument to, to wind turbines. You can turn that argument to solar panels and say solar panels are bad because they use coal um, to melt the silicone. And so, but of course, we accept that with solar panels, that would be a ludicrous argument. We say, well, sure, it, it has a carbon footprint, but it pays off that footprint after one and a half years. And the other 25 years of use is net carbon negative. So it's, it's a wonderful technology. So not and just so the what, financial payoff, it pays off its carbon debt in one and a correct. half years. Correct. That's really significant. Yeah. Solar okay. will pay it off over one and a half years. So it has a carbon debt. When solar is first created, it has a carbon debt. It has an e-waste debt. Um, sound familiar? Just like Bitcoin mining does as well. In fact, with solar, um, the, the e-waste is even harder to dispose of because it has so many different metals. It's very hard to dispose of solar panels, much easier with Bitcoin miners, in fact. So what we've got to do in each case, if we're going to have a true ESG analysis, we have to look at the life cycle of any technology. And we've got to say, OK, what's going to be the carbon footprint of this technology? And any technology will have a carbon footprint. Any technology. Even if you're building wooden boats using wooden rivets, um, you're probably still using saws, and those saws have come from metal, and that metal has come from someone who's used some coal furnace to, to smelt that metal at some point. So you can't get away from that, but you've got to look at, well, what's the positive? And that's what we've got to start doing with Bitcoin as well. We've got to say, Here is the, here's the footprint of solar. Here's the footprint of wind. Here's the footprint of building a hydroelectric dam. Here's the footprint of Bitcoin. Now let's look at the other side of the equation. Let's look at the benefit that each of these technologies does so we can have a true analysis rather than a biased analysis of what the net environmental cost or benefit of this technology is. So that's what we've got to start doing with Bitcoin. And I think if we can encourage people to say, look, it would be unfair to go into a business as an analyst and just look at the, say, okay, show us all your expenses. 
And then the business shows expenses say, well, you should close down your business because you've got way too many expenses. You're a bad business. And the business says, hang on a minute, you haven't looked at my, my revenue yet. We, we wouldn't do that. So in the same way, it's incomplete to only look at the cost of a technology without looking at the benefit as well. And that's where we've just got to start opening people's eyes and saying, okay, yes, like other technologies, it has a cost. And what is the associate benefit? Let's look at that side of the ledger too. So that's a really important point you make because quite often in these arguments, they're just sort of uh, first blush, what is the major point? Oh, it consumes carbon, so it must be bad. And that's that takes a longer time and investment to actually overcome in an argument than merely a dot point jab to say, Bitcoin is bad, for example. And we can see this on Twitter in the arguments. It's really easy to make a critique of Bitcoin in just one glib line, a few words, a short sentence. You, every argument that, that I've heard against, against Bitcoin, you can take out the word Bitcoin and you can insert the word technology and the argument would be equally true. Now, no one would suggest that we stop using technology and we go back to a pre-technological era. You'd have to go back quite a long way. Um, so... I think we need to change the frame and I encourage Bitcoiners to be a bit less defensive and not to just get defensive and say, oh, yes, but it uses uh, more. Well, we can, of course, we can say it uses more renewables and it's number one. We should say those things, but it's much more important to change the frame and saying, yes, of course, like all technologies, it uses energy. And like all technologies, we should do everything in our power to make sure as much of that as possible is renewable. 100%. And let's also look at the good that it's doing. And when you change the frame in that way, um, then you're not kind of getting on the back foot because the moment you've, you're facing this argument that it's bad and you start debating whether it's bad or not, you're already playing a defensive strategy. Whereas if you're looking and saying, yes, we accept that, let's come back to that. Let's look at the full picture here. Let's look at the good that it does. Let's look at how it removes methane from the atmosphere, which is our the gas which the United Nations Environmental Program is most worried about in the world. And let's look at how that actually does a better job than any technology we've got to date of taking that away. That's significant. Now let's look at the grid. Let's look at how it's helping to stabilize the extra volume of solar and wind on the grid with more flexibility than any other technology we've had to date in order to be controlling that flexible load. And you start to look into the subtleties here and you start to see a very, very different picture than the, the one-dimensional cost-only picture that we've had in mainstream media to date. So we're replacing a, a very one-dimensional um, picture with, with a true picture based on some analysis based on rather than uh, mythology, is what I would say. So I, I wonder if it, it has something to do with the uh, difference in circumstances of the people who make the critic criticisms which are largely in uh, in wealthy western nations and the people at this point in time who are most benefiting from having um, a monetary network and and currency means of exchange in an environment of high instability and they those differences so the argument against bitcoin are largely being held in wealthy countries and the media particularly on twitter but we, we rarely hear those same criticisms come from places with hyperinflation, do we? So you don't hear too many, too many Turkish people complaining about Bitcoin right now with inflation, probably in, in unofficial estimates, over 100% Argentina. Yeah. And yeah. you know, we, could, we could go through that whole list. We don't see too many criticisms of Bitcoin and its energy consumption coming from those places. Um, but they mostly seem to be in, in privileged circles in wealthy Western nations. I, I wonder if that has something to do with, um, yeah, to do with a, uh, the motivations. Huge yeah, amount to do with it because it's easier to criticize a technology if you personally cannot see its value. Solar, it's very easy to see its value. It's very apparent. Bitcoin, if you come from the West, is less immediately apparent. And that's, that's true of a lot of things with Bitcoin. A lot of the, the true benefits of Bitcoin are not immediately apparent. It's counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive that something that uses energy could actually be a beneficial consumer that could help load balance the variability of solar and wind. That's counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive, the idea 
that burning methane, producing carbon dioxide, is good for the environment. In fact, it's not good for the environment if it's coming from a gas stove, but it's incredibly good for the environment if you take methane that would have gone into the atmosphere and you're stopping it going into the atmosphere. That's carbon negative. And it's the same with the, the use of Bitcoin. It's, if you come from the West again, you think, well, I've got, why do I need Bitcoin? It's just a, it seems to be a speculative asset. I know a few people have done well by it. I haven't. It seems to be frivolous. It seems to be a Ponzi. All these things come up. But again, this can only come up if you haven't seen the incredible value and utility that it provides primarily outside the West. And this is another counterintuitive thing about Bitcoin. Every other technology in the world that I can think of benefits the West first. And then after the West has had its turn, the rest of the world gets it. Mm. Cell phone technology, iPhones, just about anything you name. Bitcoin flips that on its head. And it's, it's Nigeria or El Salvador or Turkey or Argentina or Ukraine where, or Afghanistan. These are the countries where it's, it's changing people's lives. It literally is. And I, and I loved it. I said that in, in my first interview with uh, Natalie on Natalie's uh, podcast. This is an outsider's game. And I love that it's an outsider's game. But it also throws up a lot of counterintuitive uh, realizations as well. It takes quite a bit of thought and time and study to understand them. The energy example is just one, but quite, you know, mm. quite a lot of um, uh, benefits of Bitcoin are equally counterintuitive. Um, gosh, I was just about to uh, say something. No, it's escaped me. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, my, my powers of recollection have not been uh, good lately. I did this in another interview the other day. Um, so, I mean, for, for that reason alone, I, I think a lot of us get frustrated in trying to explain it to people. Um, but the more you look at Bitcoin, the better you understand those benefits. And I think what you said about the inverted benefits, it first comes to the outside of the outside countries um, in Western countries, it's mostly been the people, culturally speaking, who have been outside of institutions, outside of the mainstream, who have adopted Bitcoin first. And I'd I'm really happy to see that from a, a geopolitical perspective, you know, seeing El Salvador do that. And we, we know El Salvador's relationship with uh, global financial institutions has been a troubled one, particularly with mm. the IMF, World Bank and whatnot. So it's really good that it actually presents an option for these countries. And as a result of adopting Bitcoin, what we're seeing is that their tourism numbers are just going through the roof. Um, it's bringing the kind of attention that, you know, tourism campaigns just can't buy. They wouldn't have had the funds to generate that mm. level of business. And I'm looking to visit El Salvador very, very, very soon, actually. So I, I never would have done that without, you know, if they didn't adopt Bitcoin. But anyway, get, getting back to... Mm. Getting back to this energy um, uh, debate, I, I, just to recap, I, I think it's a it's a really it's a really good development that we're now seeing the, I guess, uh, a joint venture between Bitcoin mining and oil and gas exploration. We're starting to see the realization that uh, landfill methane can now be harnessed in a very productive way. Um, and you, you said that this is now reaching the point where it can scale. I'm really excited to see that happening as well. Um, and and let's, let's just recap. The benefits of displacing methane from the atmosphere are 30x the greenhouse effect of carbon. So that's what, give, that's what gives it that importance from a, a greenhouse uh, perspective. And that's really important to remember as well. Uh, was there anything else you wanted to add to that before we open up the floor for some questions and comments from the audience? Yeah, when you put it all together, I started being curious and I wanted to quantify some stuff because there'd been a, a lot of people who'd said, yes, it has an advantage. And I wanted to quantify how much of an advantage, how much, how many carbon emissions it could take away. And so we start to look at the potential of Bitcoin in the areas around the world where we could deploy it, around landfills and around oil and gas fields, just those two alone, and there's many other sources of methane that we haven't even gone into, but just those two alone, and you look at the areas which are politically accessible, they're, they're 
logistically accessible. They don't have an alternative source for those methane emissions. Then you start to get some really huge potential numbers in terms of the methane it can take off the table. It can basically reduce 23% of our global human-made methane emissions, 23%. That number is really significant because it happens to be almost exactly half of what the United Nations Environmental Programme have said that if we achieve, we take half, we, we take 45% of the methane emissions off the table. They've said that'll stop 0.3 degrees Celsius of climate change. That's a United Nations Environmental Programme statistic. If we remove 45% of the current methane emissions, it'll slow down climate change by 0.3 degrees Celsius, which is huge in the context of things. So for Bitcoin mining to have the potential to eliminate half of that figure by itself, a single technology, it is truly extraordinary. Now, of course, there's a lot of work to be done to get it to the point where it can scale that fast. But as we've seen, Bitcoin does have the potential to scale that fast because it is mobile, it's location agnostic, and because there's a business case, it provides a profitable joint venture as opposed to an expense which needs someone to debate about who should be paying for it. So when we look at the climate impact, its potential is absolutely huge. And that's one of the things I get most excited about because I haven't seen any other technologies which can actually take that, that methane out of our atmosphere as fast. And we've been told by the IPCC, we've got to act fast um, if we're going to solve some of these world's toughest climate challenges. Methane, by the way, it's not just a, it doesn't just cause climate change. It's also responsible for hundreds of thousands of premature deaths each year. It causes respiratory illnesses. It has all sorts of um, nasty reasons why you don't want it in the atmosphere. It just occurred to me, you know, um, we've spoken about Greenpeace previously and, and um, their position on, on Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining. Have Are they open, are they receptive to speaking to people who are both environmentalists and Bitcoin investors? I'm going to test that theory out very soon. <laughs> I, oh, wow. I know, okay. a couple, I, know, I know a few people in Greenpeace. Some of them are my friends and I'm going to, I'm going to test that and I will let you know whether there's openness and receptivity there. Yeah, yes, of uh, course, look, because... I, But I absolutely believe there are some people there who would be open to, mm. to having a debate and going deep into it. Well, not even a debate. I, I prefer not to get into debates. I like to get into conversations and mm. just to, to help to understand where there may be misconceptions uh, because fundamentally the reason that I got into doing this research in the first place was as an environmentalist, I was interested to find is Bitcoin good for the environment or not? And I didn't know. And I was getting conflicting messages. So I thought, well, I'll do my own research. I'll find out. And these answers really surprised me. I wasn't expecting to find that it could be as positive for the environment as, as I actually found out. And it's, that's part of what's counterintuitive. The more you dig, the more you go into the nuances of how it works, the more you go, this is crazy. This is, this is better than even the miners are telling us. The miners aren't busy waxing lyrical about how green they are. That's not their job. They're engineers. They're computer scientists. They, they are solving problems. Uh, hmm. So, And there's no, Bitcoin isn't a corporation, so there's no marketing department who's performing that function of telling the story as of what they're doing. So into that gap, there's been this other narrative. Um, and so it's really important that we start to tell the true picture based on the deep analysis, not the superficial appearance of what Bitcoin miners are actually doing when they're using the stranded energy, not just monetizing it, but taking some of these really danger, dangerous and toxic um, emitters out of the atmosphere. Yeah, so we, we didn't go through that um, in this discussion, but a little bit about your background. You came to this as an environmentalist, a lifelong committed environmentalist, and uh, you discovered the benefits of Bitcoin through that lens and so it's not that you're talking up your your own uh, your portfolio and you're just uh, trying to manipulate a, an environmental angle to your benefit you actually are a lifelong environmentalist first and you came to bitcoin second yeah this is something that i've like we we've launched two climate tech funds so this is what i spend a lot of my time doing and we invest in technologies which are going to solve some of the world's toughest um, emission pro problems. 
We've invested in a technology that helps to decarbonize the zinc recycling sector. We've invested in a company which helps to remove carbon emissions from the greenhouse uh, industrial scale greenhouses and what what we realized was these these were great investments and we should continue to do more of them and we we had to do more because most of these technologies are not going to achieve scale until after 2030 and we need to be acting more urgently and so this is what got me very interested in answering the question well, well what else could what could we be doing what could we be investing in that could have a more immediate effect we still got to take the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, but how can we remove these methane emissions as well? And I, I was honestly quite surprised to find out the extent to which Bitcoin mining was a solution. And when we compared it towards a lot of the other solutions that have been proposed, um, oxidation techniques, sequestration techniques, it was the only one that's number one available today. Number two can scale up incredibly quickly. And number three... Um, isn't a cost, but it's actually a net uh, benefit to all the parties that get involved. You mentioned something about, about infrastructure. That's the thing about Bitcoin. It doesn't take all that much to set it up compared to setting up oil and gas infrastructure, for example. You know, like it's not viable for that gas to be piped anywhere, but uh, Bitcoin mining rigs can be set up and a generator yeah, it's, it's to go along with simple. that. Pretty simple. Yeah, yeah, pretty simple. Pretty yeah. simple. It's not it's not high technology and mm. it's not high risk technology. Anyway, it's not like some of the other ventures we're investing in where the technology is unproven and it's going to take eight years to prove that technology. The technology exists, it just needs to be deployed. So you're rolling out infrastructure and that's a, a simpler equation. Yeah, and, and I'm guessing that's much more appealing to your um, investors in your fund as well. Uh, it potentially very much is, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, look, um, I might open this up. Uh, we have a, uh, yep, Sicko's on, actually. Sicko was uh, on one of my previous uh, discussions. He's a Bitcoin miner from China. Let's hear what he has to say. Go ahead, Sicko. Uh, thanks, mate, for having me. Uh, hi to everybody. Hi, Daniel, as well. I think, mate, you're, you're great. Your knowledge about energy is incredible. Uh, we exchanged a few words in another chat by Twitter, so we talk about a little bit about energy in China and things like that. But I, I wanted to kind of ask you, uh, it's kind of like a future question, but something that it comes to my mind when it comes to mining, because I agree with you. I mean, the solution has start, it has to start with the, with the ones that are making the, the pollution of the world. So basically oil companies and all these things. So I think we have to include them in the solution, of course, it's mm. obvious. But my, my worry is, these are larger companies. These are mega companies that have largest amounts of money, largest amount of, of muscle, financial muscle. And they can come easily to a manufacturer like Bitman and say, you know what, I'll buy all your production for the next five years if this really works. And then you, you kind of start losing that, that appealing on Bitcoin mining, which is decentralization. So yeah. because, because you start consolidating the industry, which it happens in normal markets, right? It, they tend to consolidate. You see it in the car manufacturer. You see it in... In electronic device, the markets tend to consolidate. So, it, it is, is this a worrisome, or do you see more like an opportunity as well? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I think because of the Bitcoin community being what it is, there's a lot of uh, people who, who want to keep it as decentralized as possible. And it's, it's a really interesting tension because mining in particular works on economies of scale. And, and that's why we've started to see a minor capitulation recently is that miners is a category. It doesn't really exist. There's really four categories of miners. You've got the retail miners, you've got the commercial, you've got commercial hosted miners, you've got enterprise scale. And the retail miners have been burnt off. They were unprofitable from 32,000 US dollars a Bitcoin and below because they simply couldn't get wholesale electricity. They couldn't get electricity cheap enough and they couldn't get their ant miners cheap enough either. And so the, the ones who are still in the game, they're the enterprise level miners. And so they've had, had the scale that they can negotiate really good wholesale electricity prices. They're often using stranded energy or renewable energy, which is generally that any energy that's going to get wasted is the cheapest. But because of the scale, they've also been able to um, get really good deals on their mining rigs. So how does that work if it favors scale on one hand, but you've got a Bitcoin community, as you say, 
which is wants to keep the, the vision really should be to keep mining just as decentralized as Bitcoin is. Uh, there are some people working on this is all I can say. Um, I'm talking to a lot of mining companies right now and some people with some smart ideas, but you are going to see some solutions. People are working on this really hard um, so that we can keep that decentralized vision alive and we can still keep retail involved. So there are, there are ways to do that and there are Bitcoiners who are actively aware of this challenge and, and who are working to keep it as decentralized as possible. That's about all I can say at the moment. My, my understanding is Block is working on a solution that will be more readily available to retail Bitcoin, yeah. Bitcoin miners. Mm. So that will be an interesting development. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing that. But uh, yeah, I wonder if it's a real risk. Though. I mean, I've heard people who are much more uh, technical on Bitcoin saying, you know, Bitcoin miners are at the service of the network. They don't control the network. Um, so I'm guessing, Sika, you're asking... Uh, with a potential fifty one percent attack in mind, is that right? Mm, no, I'm not. I'm not that really worried about a fifty one percent attack because I think the market is mature enough to kind of avoid that. I mean, it's mm. larger enough that if you want to do a fifty one percent attack, it will it will require four BPs basically. So <laughs> I don't think that is possible. However, it's not about that. It's about uh, it's about the network itself being up all the time. So let's, for example, it consolidates in 10 companies. And let's say out of these 10 companies, I don't know, five shut down for some reason. Some country decide to invade another country like we're seeing right now. And then we have an issue. So what happens is that the network gets basically jammed, congested, cannot hold the load. And then we, we, we see problems. So it was more like that question. I mean, we don't really want to see consolidation in terms of decentralization because it, it doesn't benefit the network but i agree maybe we'll see something um, in a blend like maybe a proof of work combined with a proof of stake kind of retail kind of base something like that i don't know it's something that maybe it will mix the two technologies and maybe it will work hmm. okay perhaps something we can explore another time i appreciate your your comment and question Siko. uh Anush, oh, sure. you're Thanks next Anush, go ahead yeah, uh, thanks, Ashi and uh, Daniel. I, I was there in, in your first part as well. And uh, again, uh, thanks for hosting uh, such uh, insightful uh, sessions. So my questions to Daniel, as we were discussing about the UN as well, and the UN program that is uh, UN uh, action of, to uh, stop the uh, rising climate change. So how, how do you see, like, who can put forward the uh, Bitcoin case, Bitcoin miners case in UN? Do you think the uh, Bitcoin... Uh, Again, the mining counseling, uh, mine, mining council could be the one of the organization uh, that could take uh, this case in the UN and uh, tell the uh, UN folks that this is what the Bitcoin ecosystem is doing uh, to support the environment. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I think someone's got to, absolutely, because it doesn't seem to be well understood. And, and I've read through some of these documents, the IPCC documents, and there's no mention of Bitcoin mining at all. The grid, the grid operators are actually much more aware of the potential of Bitcoin to load balance and accelerate the adoption of renewables than, than a lot of the, the United Nations Environmental Program currently is about the potential of Bitcoin mining um, to solve some of these methane issues. I think that's simply because it's newer. Um, it's, it's, it's only really started to happen in the last 18 months. In terms of who's best placed to do it, I'm, the Bitcoin... Mining Council, their focus is really more on the side of showing the percentage of Bitcoin mining that is coming from renewable sources, showing the total hash rate that is coming from renewable sources, showing where in the world it's coming from, and showing the percentage increase quarter on quarter of renewable energy. They may get into measuring curtailment in the future. Curtailment means when a solar or wind operator has to send that power onto the ground because no one wants it and how Bitcoin miners can scoop that up and they can actually help to make these solar and wind operators more profitable. So that's something else they can measure. I don't think it's really, and, and Michael Saylor has said it himself, that it's not really their mandate to go too much wider than that. So to go into the side of the ledger, which is more about a deep analysis of how it um, helps the, the renewable grid or exactly to which extent it's helping to take methane out of the air, that's not really their mandate. So that's going to be other people, um, ECG analysts, um, environmentalists, climate scientists, 
and I think there's a few of them in the Bitcoin community who can start to back that up with some data. The Sean Connells of this world, um, the people who know about how grids operate, um, there's a few of them coming out of the work, woodwork, and particularly the ones who are working closely, who are actually the miners themselves, who are working, who are actively working with landfills and are reducing emissions right now. The people who right now are providing stability to the grid. The great thing is, is that it's not just Bitcoiners who can say this now. You can you can get people who are coming from the climate tech VC companies. You can get people, the grid operators. You can get people who are the utility sides or the solar operators or the wind operators. And they're saying exactly the same thing as a Bitcoin miner. In fact, often they're saying it more positively because the Bitcoin miner is a little bit shy to be too, too, um, to tell the story as good as it really is for fear that they're going to sound like they're just in love with their own technology. So if anything, some of these, um, it's some of the people who are working with the Bitcoin miners who are who are being even more positive with the story than the Bitcoin miners themselves, I find. So I think if we can get a consortium of those people together, then we can start to really create quite a lot of credibility, particularly when it's not just the Bitcoin community. Brad Jones, who's the CEO of ERCOT, which is one of the largest islanded grids in the world, it's the grid of Texas, um, came out recently and he said, well, I don't hold any Bitcoin because I'm risk averse. Uh, but I think Bitcoin is great for the grid because it finds a home for solar and wind. And then at times of day when we can't use that solar and wind, it can soak it up. And in times when the demand gets too high, they can turn off to help provide stability to the grid. And when you get people who are the, the CEOs of grids themselves coming and talking about the critical advantage to helping build out renewables – or you're getting um, sovereign wealth funds or climate tech funds investing in technologies that are taking methane out of the air, that's when you're starting to hear not just in the quote-unquote Bitcoin community, but in the wider community, people who know about energy, who know about methane, who know about energy trading, who know how grids work at a deep level, who are all saying the same thing, that's when it gets harder and harder and harder to say that the message isn't based on fact. So I think that's the direction we've got to go. Uh, you know, so uh, one counter here, uh, we have seen in uh, 2021, more of the environmental ex- activists were putting out a narrative that uh, Bitcoin is not good for environment. Uh, there is a lot of environmental concern around Bitcoin. We heard a lot from the activists. So uh, who can like counter that? Like who can put forward these against that narrative with the facts that you mentioned? And even I watched that interview from the, that uh, CEO. And uh, this this is what well, I am well, just. I think there's a, there's a few of us who who are working. People like Troy Cross, people like Nick Carter, um, like Margot Payers, like myself, who are, who increasingly are spending more and more of our time doing this. And there's a lot of patience required too, because you know grids are hard to understand. You got to know a bit about physics, a bit about mathematics, about economics. You got to piece all those things together, and. If you just start talking about curtailment and load balancing and voltage regulation, then suddenly you just people's eyes glaze over and, and the information won't go in. So we've actually got to be good at talking about some challenging ideas in ways that make sense um, so people don't feel that the wall's been pulled over their eyes. But actually, no, these are genuine benefits that without uh, these benefits that Bitcoin provide, you actually cannot build a renewable grid in time. Excellent. Thanks for, thanks Thanks. for your comment and questions, Anders. Mario, you're next. Go ahead. Are you there, Mario? Sorry, sorry. I'm in the guard now. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, Mario's dropped out, so uh, let's see who else we've got. Uh, Okay. Okay, Cryptomania, you're up. Uh, unmute your mic and we are ready for you. Go ahead. Are you there, Cryptomania? One last shot. Go ahead. Okay, I think we will call it a day. Daniel, that's been a really good session. Really appreciate your time. Is there anything else you want to add before we uh, close the session out? No, I think you've summarized it all pretty well. Um, if there's one more thing, I'll just say that if we're looking, it's very rare 
that you find a technology that can do not one thing really well for the environment, but two. And that's that it has just as positive an effect in mopping up methane as it does building up the renewable grid. And see, what's even more remarkable about it is that it was never designed to have an environmental benefit. So these are all completely accidental benefits. And I just marvel at how these benefits have come along. And perhaps that's part of the challenge we have, is that it was never designed primarily um, to have this environmental benefit. But since it's, we have accidentally discovered it, it's pretty convenient. And I just hope we can all exercise a bit of patience and talking to people who may have a, a different viewpoint, who may have come to some misunderstandings. And just remember, um, I myself, when I first read the FUD in the papers, thought Bitcoin must be bad for the environment. Um, so it is possible to, with common sense and with patience, to, to talk people through their misconceptions and give them a bigger picture. Um, and it's worth it. So I encourage people to point them to the research, point them to people who have thought deeply about these issues. Stay patient um, because it's important. And the more people that get it, it's not just good for the Bitcoin community. It's good for the world uh, because it can actually solve some of our major, major challenges. Excellent. Thanks again, Daniel. That was really, really good. For those of you who are interested in the first part of this discussion, you can go on to my YouTube channel. It's called Bitcoin Archive with Archie, and there you will find uh, the discussion I had with Daniel about Bitcoin mining helping to accelerate renewable energy adoption as well, and that'll, that'll be a nice accompaniment to this discussion as well. So thank you all for tuning in again. Daniel, thank you for coming on to my spaces once more. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, it's been fun. Thank you. Thanks, guys.